Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 13 through 16, and it can be found in your pew Bible on page 740. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. I want to tell you about two different groups of people. The first was a group called the Essenes, and they were around at the time of Jesus. They were an extremely devout group of people who basically looked around and said, the world is falling apart, there's moral corruption, Uh, we need to form a community where we can really focus on obeying God and on keeping ourselves pure. So that's exactly what they did. They went out into the desert, um, out beyond Jerusalem, and they formed this monastic community where they worshipped and prayed and read scripture and just sort of minded their own business and did their own thing. They even called themselves the sons of light because they thought that they and they alone were walking in God's truth. Now, the second group I want to tell you about is a church in Chicago called Missio Dei Church, which means the mission of God. Uh, this, it's a large church, but it, it meets in different groups across different neighborhoods in the city called Gospel Communities. Uh, now, Chicago, as you know, is a big city with a lot of big city problems like drug use and gang violence and racial tension, and homelessness, and poverty, and secularism, and moral decay, and and all the things that are going on in this world. Plenty of evidence that the world is falling apart. But the, the people in these gospel communities, they don't mind their own business. They don't keep to themselves. They, they go out into the mess, and they get involved. They serve on local PTOs and committees. Uh, They have outreach events, handing out water bottles at the Gay Pride Parade. Um, They care for refugee families. They they reach out to commuters. They're they're out there in getting involved in the world. Now, if you understand the difference between those two groups that I just told you about, you'll get what Jesus is saying when he says, "You are the salt of the earth." And you are the light of the world. Jesus says that his followers have something that the world needs uh, that only they can give, which is the saltiness and the light of the gospel. And it doesn't work when it's kept to itself. It only works when it's out there in the mess and in the darkness of the world. So, So hear me clearly in this point, if you are a Christian, a disciple of Jesus, then people are waiting for you to bring the difference that only you can bring to their lives. The the single unifying theme of this Sermon on the Mount, which we're going through, is that disciples of Jesus are different, okay? They're, They're different than the pagans around them. They're also different from the religious people around them. They have a different set of values and goals and uh, motivating uh, forces driving them. Disciples of Jesus are different. Now, in the previous section, the Beatitudes, we learned about how the disciples, disciples of Jesus have a different character. Um, But then, in this section that Roy just read, 
Jesus is saying that disciples are different in order to make a difference. You see that? They're, they're different so that they can make a difference in a dark world that's needy of the gospel. People are waiting for the difference that only you can bring them. Please pray with me as we dive in further. Lord Jesus, I believe that your word is as powerful today as it was when you first spoke these words. So we pray that you would make these familiar words come to, li- come to life to us in a new way um, and move us to be the salt and the light that this world needs. Amen. So Jesus takes these two extremely common things, salt and light, uh, to make one extremely simple but profound point. And all I want to do is look at each one, salt and then light, and just try to let Jesus' logic sink in and help teach us what it means to be salt and light. So first, you are the salt of the earth. Let's read verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. If there is one seasoning we have in our pantries, all of us, it's salt. I can guarantee that everyone here has salt somewhere in your house. Um, And we add it to things, just like like Jack said, to, to make our food more flavorful to bring the flavor out of our food. And that was true in Jesus' time too. People didn't like bland food 2,000 years ago either. Um, But there was an even more important use for salt back in Jesus' time. It was a preservative. Think about it. You don't have refrigerators. You don't have freezers or even ice. So how do you keep meat from going bad so that you can store it and eat it. You you rub rub salt into it. You fill it full of salt. And the salt would would help slow down or stop the the decaying process of that meat. It was a preservative. So so salt was a pretty crucial part of life that everybody was familiar with. Now just ponder what Jesus is saying here. You are the salt of the earth. So your job is to add flavor to life, and to slow down the decay of the world, right? So two points and then a question. Uh, First, life without faith in Jesus is ultimately boring and bland. I mean, don't let anyone tell you that by being a Christian you're missing out on something fun or interesting because sin, um, sin is eternally boring, it doesn't provide any joy, any satisfaction, any, uh, anything worth living for. Um, and there are millions who need the salt of the gospel. Uh, they need the flavor that the gospel brings to their lives. But second, not only do people need the flavor and kind of the spice of life that the gospel brings, but the world is falling apart. The world is decaying, isn't it? And it doesn't need sugar to make it sweeter, <laughs> to make the decay smell better. It needs salt to slow it down or to stop the decay process. That's what Jesus' disciples do. You're the salt that is called to go into that mess and that decay Uh, wherever you see things falling apart and get rubbed into that situation like salt into some decaying meat. Okay, you're you're the salt that that slows down um, the the moral decaying process of our world. You have the difference that people are waiting for and that, that people need. So here's the question. Do you, do you hold back or do, do you go in? When you see messy situations or see things falling apart, do you throw up your hands and say, what's the world coming to? Or do you say, hey, I'm the one they need. I'm the salt that needs to get in there and, and uh, add some preservative here. You see what I'm saying? 
Right before this section in the, are the Beatitudes, which are all about the character of a disciple. So, so when you bring that character to bear on the world around you, you're being salty. Let me give you some examples. The break room gossip at your office. When you speak up for what's right, you're being salty, aren't you? Or the strained or messy relationship that you're in the middle of in your family or with some friends. You're salty when you, when you don't retreat, but you get into that and try to become a peacemaker in whatever way you can. Or think about your friend or your neighbor who's going along happily in their life without Jesus. You're salty when you, when you risk sharing the gospel with them, even if it means your relationship gets shooken up a little bit. That's what it means to be the, the salt. You're, uh, you're um, getting into those situations, even if it stings sometimes, right? And I know for certain that all of you, all of us are aware of some pretty messy and some pretty decaying situations in our workplace, in our families, in our neighborhoods, in the world at large. I mean, we, we all see it every day at school. There is some messy stuff going on. But, but get this, when Jesus says you are the salt of the earth, in the Greek language, the, the you there is emphatic. So he's not just saying you're the salt of the earth. He's saying you are the salt of the earth. You and you alone have what this world needs. You, you have the salt of the gospel. So don't, don't pull back and just wonder what the world is coming to, but, but the world is waiting for you to bring the gospel into those situations. You're the salt. Here's the thing. You can only do that job. You can only be the salt if you're distinct, if you're salty, right? And Christians are distinct, at least we should be. I mean, we have different values and goals and hopes, and we march to the beat of a different drum than the world, right? That's why Jesus says in verse 13, if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. If the one thing that makes salt salt goes away, what do you have? <laughs> Maybe just like a white sand that you can use to fill cracks in the cobblestones. It's not salt. It can't do what salt does. I have a friend who's the director of a Christian organization that's called Jill's House. And what they do is they provide services and, and respite care for families with children that have special needs, like um, autism or Down syndrome or... Uh, any kind of special need that makes it hard for them to care for them. So my friend is the director of this organization. And in their mission, they're pretty clear that they're a gospel-centered organization. So they serve everybody. They, they serve Christians and non-Christians. But they're clear that they're doing it because of the gospel. And they actually include, you know, opportunities to share the gospel with their, with their clients. Now, they have a dilemma because my friend told me, of course, the perpetual need of nonprofits is funding, right? And he said, Tyler, it would be a lot easier if, if we could just kind of get rid of that whole gospel side of things and tap into all these other funding sources and not have to have those awkward conversations about being a Christian organization. It would make funding a lot easier. But he said, we can't do it. Because we would be losing our saltiness. We'd be, we'd be losing the mission that we have of the gospel. We'd be losing our saltiness. I think he's right, and that can happen in our lives as well. Whenever we kind of, kind of sell out or kind of blend in with the crowd or go along with what everyone else is doing, we're losing our saltiness. We're, we're not bringing the gospel to bear like we should. The world doesn't need Christians like that. It doesn't need bland, tasteless Christians who just kind of keep people happy. Disciples of Jesus uh, are radically different from the world so they can share that difference with them. The world needs, needs salty Christians. 
People are waiting for that. They're waiting for the difference that you can bring them because of your salt. I have this mental image of our church being a giant salt shaker with some little holes in the steeple maybe. And every week after we come into this place and we leave here, it's like God turning over that salt shaker and shaking us out into Burlington and Milton and St. Albans and Georgia, all the places that we go each week, into our schools. He's shaking us out of this place to be salt in the world. Well, he also says, you are the light of the world. And I think that metaphor adds some more dimension to our mission. So let's read verses 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, in some ways, this is repeating, just saying in a different way, the same thing that he said about being salt. Um, But I think it's also adding something. So, So we're the salt, which helps preserve the world, but we're also the light, which is attractive and illuminating. And that metaphor of a city on a hill really drives that point home. Uh, At night, light is very attractive, isn't it? (laughs) I was going to ask you, have you ever been in some place really, really dark? And then I realized, it's Vermont, of course you have. (laughs) If I was still out in Chicago, I'd have to say, you know, sometimes when you're far away from the city and you're outside, you can't see anything, there's no street lights, there's no big signs and billboards and and, uh, light from the city going up into the sky. But but you know what it's like to be out where it's really, really dark. And you know how even the smallest flicker of light, when it's really dark, you can see for a long way away. And it's attractive, isn't it? Now, back in Jesus' day, before electricity, it was really, really dark, except in the towns where they had uh, lanterns and torches and oil lamps. So if you're a traveler or if you're out somewhere at night and you see that city up on a, the crest of a hill, you'd see it for, for miles and miles and miles. And that would be kind of your, your destination. That would be attractive to you. You are the light of the world, like a town, like that town on a hill. People are attracted or should be attracted to you in the dark world that we're in. And the good deeds that Jesus talks about are are everything, both words and actions, that flow out of our our character, that flow out of our being followers of Christ. So it's sharing the good news about Jesus in words for sure, but it's also serving people in Jesus' name. It's how your Christian character comes to bear on every situation that you're in. You can be like a shining light. And people are waiting for that. People are, are hungry for that light. They're, they're looking for some light uh, in a dark world. Because light is necessary for, for just seeing things as they actually are, isn't it? So how many of you have had the experience of maybe being in a hotel or a, a, a friend's house at night and you have to get up and go to the bathroom and you're just like stumbling through the house looking for a light switch, stubbing your toe on stuff and tripping over things. If you're a Christian, uh, remember what it was like before you knew God. It was like that, stumbling through a dark room, bumping into stuff, getting hurt, not having a point of reference, not really knowing what reality was until the light got turned on until you saw someone else's light shining who knew, the, who knew the Lord, who shared the gospel with you. And then the lights came on and you, you saw things the way they really were. People, people are waiting for you to do that for them, to shine in their lives and to, to be the light that they need. Maybe some of you here still feel like you're in that dark room and you're stumbling around and you don't have... Uh, you don't 
know the Lord and you, you're, you're, you feel like um, maybe some hopelessness or some despair, well, Jesus wants to turn on the light in your life and, and to sh- help you understand the gospel and get, help you understand him and turn on that light in your life. Well, just like the idea of being <laughs> of unsalty salt is a little bit humorous, Jesus is saying here that it would be pretty stupid to light a candle and then put a bowl over it, wouldn't it? It would defeat the whole purpose of lighting that lamp. No, you actually, you light it so that the whole room can be illuminated. You put it up high somewhere so it can give the maximum amount of light. Do you remember that song, This Little Light of Mine? Hide it under a bushel. No! <laughs> when we sing that with Chloe and Asher, that's the one part they go. They No! 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 But we're not supposed to hide it under a basket or a bushel. Even though it's easier to do that sometimes, isn't it? It's easier to just kind of stick to ourselves and just light up the inside of this basket, of this, inside of this bowl, rather than to be out in the darkness where people actually need the light. Don't hide the light of the gospel shining through you. I don't think there's, any, there's such thing as a secret Christian or an undercover Christian or someone who says, well, my beliefs, I just keep them pretty private and nobody needs to know about what I believe. No, you're the light of the world. People need to see the light in order to be attracted to the light. So let your light shine. Once again here, the you is emphatic. He's saying, you and only you are the light of the world. Therefore, friends, if we don't shine... Nobody's going to shine. If Christians don't shine the light of the gospel, there will be no light for people to see and to come to Christ. I hope you feel the, the urgency of that. I hope you feel, the, in a good way, the, the pressure of that command to encourage you to, to shine. People are waiting for that light from you. Well, I want to end with both a challenge and an encouragement The challenge is the fact, which we've already mentioned, that um, Jesus is really giving us a command here which is um, challenging. He's saying there's a big job to do. There's a world that needs salt and light that you can bring. I hope you have a healthy fear of not doing that. And if you don't, I haven't explained it clearly enough. And it can be even more overwhelming to think about doing that when we just look around and see how dark the world is or how much it's decaying. Like, how can I possibly make a difference in this dark world? How can I possibly, you know, add any preservative in this decaying world? Well, here's the encouragement. Actually, I have two. The first one is that it's not about us it's about God, right? Uh, look, in, he says, In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. It's not about how well we do it. It's about people giving God more praise and attention. Therefore, if we are simply faithful to let our light shine, the results are up to God. You don't have to be a a 50,000-watt stadium floodlight, okay? You can just be the little light that you are and just don't cover it up. <laughs> just, just let it. He says, let it shine. Just let your light shine. A little bit of light goes a long way, just like a little salt goes a long way on some food. A little bit of light goes a long way in the darkness. I think every one of you has a situation or many situations in your life that God is inviting you to add some salt to with your character and add some light to. Just pray, as you think of those situations, pray that God would give you grace to let your light shine. And here's the second encouragement, which is probably more important. Somebody else said, call themselves the light of the world. 
I mean, Jesus used that term, light of the world, for somebody else, and it was himself, right? He said in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, Jesus is the true light, and any light that we give off is really a reflected light from him. Like, he's the sun, and we are those um, little pathway lights with the solar panels on top. They get charged up during the day, and then at night they can shine, right? That's us. (laughs) The light that we give off is a reflected light. It's a a glow-in-the-dark kind of light. And if you know Christ, and if you walk in His light, you will not be able to help glowing in the dark. So the, the call here really is to walk in the light of God even more, just to be present to Him, draw near to Him in prayer and um, in your thoughts and in your, in, with your will. Let Him shine on your life so that you actually have some light to give others. And you won't be able to help shining the more you come closer to Christ. So be salty and let your light shine because people are waiting for the difference that only you can bring them. Let's pray. Lord, we think of the messes uh, and the brokenness in this world, and we pray that you would help us to be salty with the gospel. Help us to be light. Help us not to lose our saltiness or to hide our light, but to be the difference that people are waiting for. Uh, We think, Lord, of our friends and neighbors and family who don't know Jesus. And we pray that you would help us shine into their lives. We pray that they would see our good deeds and glorify you. God, thank you for this time together. I pray that it would bear fruit and change each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's sing about that light in our closing hymn, which is number 437, Send the Light. And let's stand as we sing this.